fireplace was always kept in pristine condition so they could entertain guests at any time. Walls colorfully decorated with tapestries and stained glass windows gave testament to their great fortune. The servant's first assignment every morning was to clean this room. Pictures, silver plates, and silverware were polished to a shine so they could proudly be put to use at a moment's notice. And for events like their daughter's birthday, the room served an even more important role. The table's tops were removable, so they had ordered new tabletops with designs made especially for this occasion. And once the banquet had drawn to a close, tables speckled with half-empty wine glasses and leftover candied fruits were moved off to the side to make room for, of course, the festivities. Good evening, Lady Nelly. You're looking particularly lovely today. Nelly, I had these jewels cut just for you. You'll let me have this dance, won't you? Huh. What's the matter, Nelly? You look exhausted. These are pretty good. Want one? I know you like sweets. They're apples candied in rock sugar, I think. You disappoint me, dearest Mel. What do you think is the matter? They just keep coming. It never ends. It's driving me up the wall. Everyone's just repeating the same lines they've been taught. They're all pretty jewels and requests to dance. They all think pretty jewels and requests to dance are enough to make a girl swoon. But I think that is true for you, Nelly. Though, why is she disappointed with me? I think I'm done with birthday parties after this year. They'll probably throw an even bigger one next year. Huh? Why? Well, you know, you're about that age, Nelly. We are reasonably distinguished families, but there are a number of different houses that would like to have connections with us. So... So what you're saying is, do it for the family. No, that's not... I won't date or marry anyone. I have no interest in being used as a pawn in their interfamily politics. Pawn, I wouldn't go that far. And I'm sure Father wants to let you choose yourself. You know, uh, someone you actually love. Love? I never thought I would hear you talking about love, dearest Mel. Uh... You don't even understand what makes Shakespeare's plays so beautiful, and you're talking about love? I, uh... You fell asleep during Romeo and Juliet, and you're talking about love. We went all the way to the, out to the Globe Theater, too. Well, pardon me for being ignorant when it comes to romance and the arts. But you're not, Nellie. Shakespeare's make-believe story made you cry like a baby. Anyone would cry at that. You'd have to be crazy to sleep through it. That's not what I'm saying. Someone as emotionally vibrant as you, Nellie, would have no problem finding love. Dearest Mel, we should dance. Miss Nelly, could I have this? Let's dance, dearest Mel. What? Me? Wait, uh... Come on, I really like this song. Quit pulling on me, Nelly. What's the point of us dancing? We're siblings. Mother and father are staring daggers at us. No matter, what day is it today, dearest Mel? Your birthday. Exactly, so I can do what I want. Now, attend to your princess as a proper prince should. Jeez, how did I get myself into this? Nellie's skirt fluttered along with her as she stepped in time to the music. She was not only a skilled singer, but a skilled dancer as well. Mel, on the other hand, fumbled over his own feet trying to keep up. One would be hard pressed to describe his dance abilities as good even as flattery. Though boys of his pedigree were taught to dance as part of their etiquette lessons, he found himself more being dragged around by his sister. He could hardly be said to be attending to her. This is humiliating. Because his parents had been hand -off, hands off in raising him, largely giving him free reign to study and learn what he pleased, Mel looked like a tangled up marionette. From throughout the hall, he could hear giggling, uncomfortable chuckling, and people coughing to disguise their laughter. Come now, dearest Mel. If this is the best you can manage, what are you going to do when you find a girl that catches your eye? I won't, so it doesn't matter. Follow my lead, Mel. One, two, three, one, two, three. 
Nellie alone enjoyed her time dancing with her brother, and quite thoroughly at that. It did not matter to her that he moved awkwardly or that the guests were giving him cold stares. It was their parents who first cracked under the pressure, just as their father was about to give an exaggerated cough and stop, stop the music. A ruckus suddenly swelled up near the entrance. What could that be? Who knows? Whatever's going on, I've been spared. The music came to a stop, and the party guests began bustling. The sibling's father spoke up sternly above the noise in order to quell the spreading commotion. He ordered the servants to investigate, had the music restarted, and gave a short apology for the interruption, and set the party back on course. I went to go check on the entrance with the other servants, as I recall. Oh my, why are you looking at me like that? These are not my memories, but those which dwell within the mansion. Do you think we should be following what happens next from my perspective, then? That is not what confused you. Well, your question shall be answered in time. In time. Now, let us return to our tale. Though the party had fallen still for a moment, their father's decisive actions restored the guests' festive moods in short order. So it was not by any means the commotion that caused the ball to conclude earlier than planned. Oh dear, I hear thunder. It was rather loud, too. Sounds like we have quite the storm brewing. They lived in a country where the weather was nothing if not unpredictable. Rain was a frequent occurrence there. The stretches of time with the clear skies grew longer as summer approached, but the weather was still somewhat unstable on the cusp of the two seasons. They had a strong wind that night as well, which turned the raindrops into little spears on the window. Were the party to continue on any longer, no one would be able to go home. Although their father was quite concerned that Nellie had not got on with any of the aristocrat boys, he decided to cut the festivities short. Thank goodness, it ended early. How lucky I am. This must be a blessing for always being such a good girl. I'm not sure having your own birthday party cut short counts as lucky. But it was no fun. Okay, I had to stop for a moment. But it was no fun. I can't help it if I'm not enjoying myself. For heaven's sake, Arthur was here. I have no interest in dancing with that dunce. Arthur? Who's that again? Someone who was here? Unbelievable. You don't remember anything, do you, dearest Mel? He came over to play a few times when we were little. He's covered in gross freckles, and he's a huge jerk. He said my hair looked like the color of fallen leaves. Fallen leaves. Just thinking about that ugly smirk has me fuming. And yet, he acts like nothing happened. He even calls me Miss Nelly, for goodness sake. Are you listening, dearest Mel? I'm listening, I'm listening. I wonder what the ruckus earlier was. You weren't listening, were you? Who cares about that? Sorry, but aren't you curious? It probably wasn't another guest, at least. Maybe a cat sneaked in. You think so? I do. But enough about that. Would you like to play cards in my room, dear Smell? Seriously? I'm exhausted, though. It's not even that light. Fine. Something feels kind of off. A cat. I want to go check. Come on, hurry up. Hold on. You don't need to drag me, Nelly. My birthday isn't over yet, so you're not done attending to me. Oh, Nelly. I'm sure they're fine. The Shadow in the Night The rain just won't let up. I can't sleep. I wonder what the commotion earlier was about. Oh, for goodness sake. It's all the storm's fault. That's why I can't sleep. I'm just fretting over nothing. I'm sure Nellie was right. It was just a cat. Maybe a dog. I can't sleep. I hardly ever have this much trouble falling asleep. What could this feeling be, I wonder? 
It's not quite foreboding. Walking around the house at this time of night isn't going to help anything. But I'm not going to fall asleep just lying here. The only sounds that could be heard in the dark was from the sharp pitter-patter of the rain, his footsteps, and his breathing. Though he was intimately familiar with the layout of the house, that night, the hallways felt like an endless labyrinth veiled in shadows. No moonlight shone through the windows, so naturally, he naturally found himself moving cautiously, despite being in his own residence. Keeping the palm of his hand pressed up against the chilly wall, he put one foot in front of the other. But to where was he supposed to head? Mel, of course, had no way of answering that question himself. If he had anything, it was guidance from above, the path to his destination lit by flashes of lightning. Perhaps there was something else laying him along. Though he progressed with a fair bit of hesitation in his step, Mel was slowly but surely drawing nearer to one room in particular. He made his way through the seemingly endless halls. Past the living room, its fireplace long since cooled. Into another corridor. And then stopped outside in Abigail's bedchamber. The dim glow of a lamp spilled through the cracks in the door. A gust of wind is not necessary to make a flame flicker. A person's movements, or vibrations in the air from someone speaking, the slightest emotions can cause the light of a fire to quiver. Shifting subtly, as though nudged by an invisible fingertip. I can see light from inside. Is she still awake? A voice. He seemed to be hesitating. It would not be difficult for him to approach the door and peer inside. But he had reservations about peeping in on another's chambers, even if it was his own house. Moreover, this room was assigned to a woman. There was a woman behind that door. What would you do, Master, in this situation? Would you succumb to your curiosity and gaze inside? Or would you respect the owner's privacy? I shouldn't be doing this. The voice... Feels like it's calling to... Me? Or someone else? I... Yes, me. Could sense someone watching me at that moment. He had succumbed to his curiosity. He stood on the other side of the door from me, his flaxen eyes open wide, trying to remain as invisible as possible. The wavering in his heart seemed to create faint ripples in the air, which I pretended not to notice. Yes, I knew he was there. I could sense his presence and his wavering emotions. However, I could not begin to speculate as to his true feelings, or how great a surprise this was to him. I, too, am discovering new facets of this tale by viewing it through the eyes of the mansion. But it is not I who is of concern, Master. It is you. You and... I know I shouldn't be doing this. I should be ashamed of myself. But I can't look away. Who is that? Your skin. It's so pale you can practically see through it. Is it that white because she was out in the cold rain? Her hair is white as snow, and her eyes, they're like... like... how do I describe it? My vocabulary truly lacks for situations like this. They look like... like blood? No, that's just disturbing. Then wine, perhaps. No, more translucent than that. Gemstones, then. Yes, gemstones. Her eyes are like rubies. I've never seen anyone like her before. What could they be talking about? Mel's eyes were fixed on the peculiar young woman. She had glass-like skin, eyes that glimmered in the flickering candlelight, and snow-white hair that flowed like luxurious silk. But her lips were bluish-purple, her soft, delicate skin sullied with grime, her twinkling eyes pointed down at the floor, and her hair a disheveled mess. She was, even at a glance, clearly not a lady of means. The tips of her fingers were cracked from the cold, her nails pale from malnutrition, and her garb little more than rags. However, true beauty is always visible, no matter what it may be hidden beneath, even wrapped in a veil of insalubrility. Insalubrity. I th think that's how it's pronounced, insalubrity. Even if 
she thought herself hideous. I wonder what happened to her. Mel could no longer avert his gaze from the girl's visage. He had, for the time being, forgotten the shame he felt for peeping at him. As he strained his ears to hear the conversation taking place inside, a sickly voice arose from the white-haired girl's purple lips. So feeble was the sound that a gentle breeze flew through the room and carried it away. I apologize for the trouble. Think nothing of it. Give it your apologies and thanks to the mistress. Understood. There's something strangely conf comforting about this house. Almost as if I've been here before. If my father were here, I'm sure he would be quite fond of it. I am sorry about your father. That's not... There's nothing you could have done, I imagine. When you came to her rescue, he was already... Rescue? Father? Was that, perchance, what the commotion was about? He stared intently, entranced by the scene unfolding beyond the door. A gaze can often signal one's presence to others more effectively than words. The white-haired girl could likely sense him there as well. She flicked her gem-like eyes upward. That was when the boy finally felt a pang of panic. For a split second, his flaxen eyes met her ruby eyes, causing him to recoil from the door. His heart was pounding like the rain outside. Careful not to make a sound, he took one, two steps away. Did she catch me? I'm not sure. It was only for a moment. She can't have seen me. The boy did not have the courage to peek into the room a second time, so he cautiously returned to his bedchamber as quietly as he could manage. But even beneath his covers, he could not erase that girl's eyes from his memory. Her melancholic red irises, her voice delicate as a glass sculpture, her pale, almost lifeless skin, her pure white hair. Every single detail kept him from banishing her image from his mind. Nor could he restrain his heavily pounding heart. Who could she be? Is something the matter? No, I just thought I felt someone watching us. It's only your imagination, I'm sure. If not your imagination, then perhaps some unseen force was watching you. Unseen force? Are you familiar with how people refer to this mansion? Rose Manor. Yes, indeed. It is called Rose Manor, because you can smell the sweet fragrance of the Rose Garden, even at a great distance. But that is not what I meant. It is said that a witch resides within the house. A witch? I have not heard any such stories. You probably wouldn't have. It was a very, very long time ago. Nothing you need to concern yourself with. You have a peculiar presence about you. Should I consider that a compliment? It's getting late. You should get some rest. A room has already been set aside for you. But first, may I ask you one thing? Yes? I do not believe you have given me your name yet. My name. My name is... Okay, we're on the next part. Find the girl. L... Mm. Wake up. Get up, Mel. What? Huh? It's morning. You disappoint me, dearest Mel. It's very much long since morning. I didn't see you at breakfast, so I came to find out what was the matter. I've really been asleep that long? And father is too lenient on you, dearest Mel. Oversleeping is hardly proper behavior for a firstborn son. I know. But before that... Yes, dearest Mel? What are you doing in here? You can't just go prancing into a boy's bedchamber. Leave that to the servants. I did send one for you. You're the one who refused to wake up. Besides, it's not like we're strangers. We used to sleep together all the time. That was long ago. Things are different now. Oh, you're overthinking it, silly. Now hurry up. 
Not too bad, sleepyhead. Alright, alright, I'm getting up. So you can see yourself out. Oh my, you look awful, dear smell. Or someone who overslept. You look like you didn't get a wink last night. You think so? You didn't go out on the town last night, did you? Naughty, naughty boy. I, I would never. You know that. You squeaked. I don't think I believe you. I didn't go out last night or anything. I'm tired because you had me playing cards until late night. Hey, we weren't playing for that long. Besides, look at me. I got up just fine. Anyway, shoot. I can't get trust with you in here. Fine, I'm leaving. Oh, I almost forgot to hear smell. What now? Come on, no need to be mean. I'm sure you'll be quite surprised at the news. Oh? At breakfast, what you missed, father told us. Told you what? Do I really want to say? It sounds like you want me out of your room, dearest Mel. Please, Nelly. <laughs> we got a new maid today. From a house we have ties to, supposedly. I've never seen anyone like her before. For supposedly coming from a good family, she isn't very graceful. And I've never seen her at social gatherings. But that's not the surprising part. Does that maid... She's peculiar. Has a very unusual appearance, that one. Have white hair? What? How do you know that dear smell? Thanks, Nelly. Hey, get back here. Oh, for goodness sake, what's gone into him? Uh... At the time, the majority of the servants at the mansion were men. However, the ladies of the house all had Abigails, so there were several woman servants, myself included. The maids, by and large, were selected from the daughters of other esteemed families. It was, you could say, a sort of training before they entered society. The girls would serve at houses even more powerful than their own, and the white-haired girl Mel saw the night before was one such maid. When he heard this, Mel could not sit still any longer. Oh, uh, I really didn't think this through, did I? she is. I'm guessing she's probably mother's maid. White hair. It has to be the girl from last night. But deep down, he was having difficulty believing the young woman he had seen the previous night was truly here to be a servant. And can you believe him? When he saw her, she was an absolute mess. Hardly what you could envision from a girl of class. But he did not seek to find out whether that was true. He merely wanted to see her once more ascertain whether what he had witnessed the previous night was real or his imagination. And he wanted to have an actual conversation with her. I don't want to run into Mother. That would be awkward. He was heading towards his mother's bedchamber, but the closer he drew, the heavier each step grew. He rounded a corner, debating whether or not to head back, and stopped in his tracks. On occasion, wishes do come true. When Mel turned the corner, he saw her, the same girl, same white hair. Ah. She appeared to be cleaning the hallway. She traced along the wooden carvings lining the walls, making certain not to miss even a speck of dust. The girl wore a pristine dress, the uniform of the mansion's Abigails. There was no longer any filth to obscure her beauty. All that had covered her pure white hair and glass-like skin was no longer. The one thing that had not changed was her listless ruby eyes. Hearing his footsteps, the young woman raised her head. She caught Mel's gaze and for a brief moment merely blinked at him in silence. Lord Mel, yes? Your father informed me of you. Did he? I guess I don't need to introduce myself then. I believe she made an attempt to smile, though it was difficult to tell, and she quickly dropped her gaze back to the floor. Flax and Ruby met only for the briefest moment. She seemed to be looking at both someone and no one at all. Everyone here has truly has the most beautiful color of hair. Did you have business with the mistress, Lord Mel? I can let her know if you would like. No, I was looking for you. For me? Mel felt as though all the blood in his body had begun to flow backwards. He could not effectively describe the sensation, but in a word, it resembled panic. 
on his way to find her, Bella came up with a number of subjects he wanted to talk about, and he generally had little trouble speaking with others. He'd had less experience interacting with women, this was true, but the time he had spent around Nellie had kept him from stumbling too much. Until then. Yes, for you. Why would you be looking for me, Lord Bell? I, I was wondering how you were doing. Pardon? I'm quite fine. Good, that's great to hear. You fool, Mel. What are you even saying? You have more important things to ask, like where she came from, or tell her she has pretty hair and eyes. But I don't want to trouble her too much. Lord Mel? Yes. Sorry, you just suddenly fell silent. As I am in your way. In my way? No, no, not at all. What are you up to? I'm cleaning. Well, yeah, I didn't even need to ask. You're cleaning. Oh, uh, you can just let the other servants take care of the cleaning. You're one of the noble stars we took in, right? Then why is Mother making... No, I'm doing this because I want to. The mistress appeared to be busy, and I could not simply be idle. But... I enjoy cleaning. Well, if you say so. Say, um, yesterday. This mansion is truly a thing of beauty. All the many roses in the garden, even the furnishing, has had a great deal of thought put into it. This family must have, have a wonderful sense of aesthetic. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks. Did she just change the subject on me? I'm delighted to have been given the opportunity to serve at such a magnificent house. Mother and father actually had nothing to do with that, not even the garden. That's all been around since my grandfather's time. This mansion was a complete wreck when he bought it. Was it? Yeah, frankly I'm surprised he actually paid money for it. The chandelier in the foyer was shattered and only half attached to the ceiling. Most of the decorations on the walls were broken. I can hardly imagine. This is marvelous. A marvelous, impressive house. I'm sure he'd be flattered to hear it. My grandfather was a bit of an eccentric. He liked to do things people didn't expect just to watch the looks of surprise on their faces. He was the kind of man who would buy a mansion that was beyond repair just to give it a completely new life. Everyone who had seen the property before it was renovated was astonished. They regretted not taking the opportunity themselves, seeing the transformation it underwent. Huh? I was just thinking that you're kind of like this house. What do you mean by that? I mean, when you first arrived... Uh, no, never mind. Forget it. She'll figure out you're peeping on her, stupid. She hasn't yet, has she? Yes? But it's nothing. The more I think about it, you and the mansion aren't really comparable. Oh. The truth is, it being a rundown mess isn't the only reason nobody wanted to buy the house. They say... ...that all who dwell within this house shall be met with misfortune. Do you believe it? I... I'm just kidding. It's not actually true. It's all rumors and hearsay, embellished to make the tale more exciting. The rumors only started because of how it used to look. If the mansion truly begot misfortune, then we wouldn't still be here. And it wouldn't explain how my grandfather died. Do you know how he passed away? No. How did he? Inside a lovely lady. What? Believe it or not, that was how he died, together with a young, beautiful woman. His time ran out while he was making love to her, they say. A uh, rather crude way to go. But he was hardly misfortunate. What did I tell you? Ah. Yes. Just so you know, I, uh, I promise I didn't inherit my grandfather's propensity for such base behavior. I am pure body and spirit, dedicated wholly to my studies, so... <laughs> hey, she left. My apologies. No, it's fine. Anyway, we were talking about the mansion, right? I've always thought it was kind of a strange place myself. That dress you're wearing, it was found here after my grandfather bought it. 
You don't see that kind of design around these parts. I'm guessing it was probably imported. The architecture is really old-fashioned, too, which must have caught Grandfather's eye. When he announced his plans to buy it, the entire family opposed his decision, but he refused to budge. Renovation upon renovation gave the mansion new life, but all of his work, he was most fond of the roses in the garden. He collected species from all over the world, and every time he got a new one, he would summon gardeners to arrange and grow them. It took incredibly long to complete. There were even some that wouldn't grow in the climate of this land, but Grandfather refused to give in. He truly loved roses. I didn't really get how someone could be so impassioned. It's just embarrassing every time someone calls this house Rose Manor. Perhaps the roses were meant for someone. What? I'm simply speculating. Roses make wonderful gifts, after all. Indeed they do. If you like roses as much as Nellie, then you're welcome to go see them for yourself. Pick as many as you'd like. If anyone asks, just say I gave you permission. I... Don't be shy. I'm sure I'll get tired if all you do is work. I just... I'm, uh, sensitive to sunlight. Oh, that's unusual. Perhaps that explains why you're so pale. I had no idea. That sounds rough. And your skin is so pretty, too. You don't seem terribly surprised. What? Oh, no. I'm very much surprised. Or would you prefer a much more dramatic response? No, I just... I expect you to find it disturbing. I'm sensitive to sunlight and can hardly spend any time outside. That makes me sound like some kind of demonic creature. It's so hard not to crack a joke right now. Oh, you worry too much. There's not a monster in the world as sweet as you. Not... Yes? Are the other maids teasing you, perhaps? That black-haired one especially, she's... How should I put it? A little frightening. Also, she has a steel heart or something. She's impenetrable. Right, she's one of Mother's maids too, isn't she? Now I'm even more worried. Since you refuse to follow my instructions, you are henceforth Hellspawn. I can imagine her saying that. Oh, and again. I'm very sorry. No need to apologize. In fact, I wish you'd laugh more. She's actually very kind to me, and everything she does, she does with incredible precision and efficiency. She looks so young, and yet she has such skill. How long has she been here in the mansion? Actually, uh, she's been here for quite some time, but I don't know exactly how long. No one knows how old she is, it's kind of creepy. I have never once considered her such. Sorry, you're right, it's bad manners to speak ill of others. Either way, she still scares me. It's like there's no light in her eyes, or like her smiles are all faked. That doesn't make her any less pretty, though. Uh, uh, the conversation died. I have to think of something else to talk about. Um, um, uh, oh, uh, yes, you can ask me anything. Does the master, your father, Lord Mel, often retire from the mansion? I have not seen him around. Oh, yeah. Father frequently returns home. This mansion is actually our secondary house. Why do you ask, though? I was just curious. Nothing more. Oh? Um. Um. Yes, what is it? One of the maids asked to see me, so I should be on my way, if you'll excuse me. What? Alright, see you later then. Goodbye. Right, one moment. Since you're sensitive to the sun, I can pick some roses from time to time for you. For you to decorate your room. Lord Mel. That's all. Sorry for holding you up. Why am I so bad at this? She definitely thinks I'm obnoxious. I want to hide under a rock. I want to reverse time and try this over again. Roses are not becoming of me. He is too kind. And I think we're in the next.
Minecraft's little subchapter. Hmm? There it goes, Tranquil Days. You have my thanks, Father. And I apologize for being late today. Now there's something unusual, you not being punctual. Maybe next we'll go a whole month without rain. Do have mercy on next year's crop smell. You hyperbolize, Father. So, did something nice happen? You look like you're in good spirits. Do I? Uh, no, uh, nothing. Something did happen, didn't it? It's all over my face, isn't it? People prefer an open book to a face of stone. So it is. People may prefer it, but it's not a good trait to have for social engagements. What? Not the kind of engagements you'll be having anyway. Sorry, don't look so dejected. For now, at least, there's nothing wrong with that. So tell me, what has you in such a joyous mood, Bill? You torment me so, Father. You've taken on another maid. You know how that goes, right? Someone new comes, and things get lively for a while. All the excitement has gotten me, gotten to me, that's all. No reason. So, what family does the lady come from? Oh, uh, I don't actually know. You don't know? I was going to ask her, but I missed my chance. Father has returned home, and I can't speak to Mother. I see. She's caught your eye, has she? Yeah, she has. But the truth is, you're more than just interested in her, are you not? esteemed family or not. No. I'm not in love with her, I'm just interested. This isn't love, no. It couldn't be. This is me we're talking about. Besides, I hardly even know her. Young sire, blessed young sire, alms for the poor. He's the same beggar as before. I don't think he's moved since then. But he looks skinnier than last time. He's going to have trouble making it through the summer. I should give him something while I still have the chance. Alms for the poor. Have mercy. Sorry, but this is all I have to give you. Thank you very much. Blessings upon you. May the Lord bless your soul, young sire. Thanks. I feel bad for him, but that's just the way of the world. Farewell. The skies are really clear. The sun shone fiercely down on the town that day. As was characteristic of the area, cloudy days and rain were frequent during this season, but the sun almost always took the stage the day after a storm. The cathedral, standing tall in the center of town, the stone paved streets clacking with the pleasant sound of footsteps, the people peering out from beneath awnings to look up at the sky. In Mel's eyes, it was as if they were all by a divine light. However, not everyone living in the same land was equally blessed. In fact, the blessed were far outnumbered by the forsaken. Even if their time would come later to be referred to as the Golden Age. Elsewhere, back at the mansion, Nellie was causing trouble for the Abigails. On a whim, she had decided to redecorate her bedchamber, so she gathered the maids and put them to work shouting orders and demands and complaints that she had not summoned only her personal servants, but others as well, including the white-haired girl. No, not like that. How many times must I tell you? The tapestry goes by the door, and I don't like the carpet's pattern. Is there anything else we can change it with? Hey, who put this ugly vase here? Nellie appeared to be rather irritated. 
and the servants on the receiving end of her frustration were probably similarly vexed, though they did not show it. She was a girl who spoke her mind, a trait particular to that time in history. Women, women of the Golden Age were so vivacious, in fact, that it inspired parody and satire in foreign countries. But no matter how hands-off her parents were, had Nellie been born a generation earlier or a generation later, she likely would not have been able to act so free-spirited. That day, however, Nellie did not seem to be her usual self. Though she always spoke her mind, it rarely went beyond being childishly adorable. It was unusual to see her in such a fall mood, not even a smile on her face. Get rid of all of it. The carpet, that chair, the desk, it's all so ugly. Don't we have anything better? If we don't, then order it. Have it made. You can do that much, can't you? Hurry up and replace them. Having only arrived that morning, the white-haired girl was unsure what she was supposed to be doing, caught in the middle of a flurry of maids of furniture and fabric. She chased frantically, scrambling Abigail's with her eyes, and made attempts to help, but not being familiar with the work, she had only ended up getting in their way. She probably felt that everyone would be better off with her not in the room. So when the maids ordered to get new furniture, made their way out of Nellie's room, she attempted to follow them. You, hold on a second. Yes, you, with the white hair. However, Nellie stopped her before she could take her leave. What? The white-haired girl turned back, bewildered to find Nellie smiling at her. The corners of her mouth turned up into a self-assured grin. There was no trace of timidity or uncertainty in her demeanor. Her flaxen eyes seemed like they would look nice under the light of the sun. Almost the exact opposite of the white-haired girl. I wanted to talk to you, actually. Mother never was one to share. I asked her to train maids, but she wouldn't have it. Train? You mean for? Her? Which is why I decided to completely redecorate my room, because then I would need some extra hands. But why? Because mother and father refused to tell me anything. Why is that? Who are you exactly? Where did you come from? Tell me, what house are you from? I. I. Why can't you tell me? If we took you in, you must be from a fairly decent family. As a member of the Rhodes family, I have a right to know. Do I not? You can't expect me to welcome a girl into my home who won't even tell me where she came from. I don't know anything about you. I haven't seen you at any parties. I'm... I came from another country. Another country? What country? Somewhere very, very far away. Oh? North of here. East, west, south. Um, south. It's south of here. I crossed the sea to get here, which is why we have never met before. How far did you have to travel, then? How many times did the sun rise, and how many stormy nights did you face? Innumerable days and nights we sailed, heading even further north. So tell me, Lady Nelly, that is a most wonderful painting. She just tried to brush me off. I won't let her get away that easy. Painting? It's in my room, so of course it's wonderful. But that, that one's especially so. You're both so adorable. You, Lady Nelly, and Lord Mel. How old were you when it was painted? Ah, that painting. Goodness, yes, you have a good eye for art. It is magnificent, isn't it? That was done when I was four and Mel was seven. You see how we're standing next to each other holding hands? I was too young to remember it very well, but Mel looks like he was really embarrassed. But standing there like statues makes for a boring painting. Nellie explained brightly. Having completely forgotten she was pressed up against the white-haired girl, she did a little twirl, stopping to face the portrait. Though many paintings had lined the walls of her room, Nellie was most fond of the one of her and her brother. Two darling siblings standing side by side, the older brother smiling kindly, the younger sister sweetly tilting her head, her cheeks the color of freshly picked apples. It was like the very embodiment of their happiness. A painting lays its subjects bare, you know. Fortune and misfortune, happiness and sorrow, enshrined on canvas for all to see. This reflection is not merely limited to the point in time it was made, either. Did you know, Master, that paintings are alive? They are drawn with a brush, over an 
extended stretch of time, unlike photographs which capture a singular moment. The two have their individual merits, but a photograph is still while a painting moves. Portraits reveal both the past and the present state of those they depict. Mel and I have always been close. I would sing songs for him, and he would teach me about all sorts of things. He's so smart. Nowadays, Mel hardly even goes on walks with me, making excuses like, I'm an adult now. But we used to spend a lot of time playing together in the Rose Garden. I see. The white-haired girl normally had difficulty smiling, but her lips naturally curled upward as Nellie reminisced. The vision of the two happy siblings had probably swelled up in her mind, and I imagine there was a faint trace of envy in her heart as well. Lady Nellie, you love Lord Mel quite deeply, I see. Yes, of course I do. Mel's smart and he's studious and he's incredibly kind. For my birthday, he gave me this wonderful rose necklace. The jewelry shop he got from was famous because even the royal family makes commissions from their workshop, so he had to have it, have it ordered months in advance. Just for me. He's a prince. He's pretty charming, wouldn't you say? That's why I call him my prince. But you know what? Mel is a terrible dancer, and he still hasn't gotten his feet on the ground yet, and he's so bad at interacting with girls. So there's no one else who would say that about him. He is quite the gentleman. I would assume women would be drawn to him. Gentlemen? Have you met Mel already? This morning, briefly. That reminds me. Mel seemed to know about her, too. said, he is a gentleman. That's not what I meant. Don't think I'll let you get away with putting any funny ideas in his head. What? Mel is too trusting. He's pure of art, so I won't stand for you trying to take advantage of him. I would never. So you say, but you actually want to get close to him. I, I wouldn't dream of it, Lady Nelly. He is a man far beyond my reach. You weren't planning on doing anything, are you? Not at all. You don't have any romantic feelings for him, do you? Uh, um, well, do you? I have no romantic feelings for him, Lady Nelly. And you won't develop any? I will not. And with that, Nelly gave a wide, satisfied grin. Even though one has no way of knowing how another truly feels, or how they might in the future. You wouldn't, would you? Now that I think about it, there are plenty of other boys. You getting together with Mel is downright absurd. Indeed. But anyway, getting back to what we were talking about earlier, your family, I almost forgot. I, um... You haven't told me exactly where you came from, or anything about your... Lady Nelly, I've brought a new carpet. Just look at the embroidery. The work of a true artisan. I'm simply in love with it. Surely you will find it to your liking as well. Oh, you're right. That's a Florentine stitch, isn't it? I wonder whether someone mimicked the style or if it was imported. Either way, a great find. Let's hurry up and get it laid out. Oh, and we'll have to see how the other colors go with everything else. We have to finish redecorating quickly so we can show Mel. He'll be so surprised. What wonderful taste you have, Nelly. <laughs> when the other Abigails returned, so too did the bustle within Nelly's room. As the white-haired girl watched, a faint smile crossed her lips. Perhaps it was from relief at having escaped Nellie's inquisition. Or perhaps... Nellie, I'm back. Did you eat something you're not supposed to, dearest Mel? You're unusually cheerful. I'm the same as always. Anyway... Never mind that, dearest Mel. Take a look at my room. I redecorated today. So that's what you've been doing, hiding away in the house all day, Nelly. How is that any different from what you were doing? You were in the church all day. I guess? I will look at your room, I promise, but first, um, do you know where the new maid is? No, no, don't get any strange ideas. I just haven't had the chance to introduce myself, and I thought I should as a member of the family. Except you have, and I know it. Being the eldest son, it would be shameful if she were to pass me in the halls, and I know who I am, so... Don't ask me. But, but you were in the house all day. She attends to Mother, so why would I know where she is? 
Oh, she did help redecorate my room. You made her help? That's work for the manservants. There was no reason to make the maids do it. Oh, so you're saying I should invite a bunch of men into my room? I go into your room all the time, Nellie, and you weren't just in my bedchamber this morning. Only one man is allowed in my bedroom, dearest Mel, and that is you. So unless you become a servant, which I will not stand for, I will not ask any of them for help. Oh, Nellie. You ought to be a little more... A little more what? If you're going to lecture me, I won't hear it. What am I going to do with you, my little lady? What? What? Why are you looking at me like that? We talked about you, dearest Mel. And I'm not going to tell you what she said. About me? What did she say? Hmm. Please, Nellie. She said... She said she has no romantic interest in you. What? Why did that even come up? Because we're both girls. We talk about things like what kind of boys we like and who's the most handsome. Why do you look so downtrodden, dearest Mel? You look like a sad little boy who can't even get his crush to notice him. That face is unbecoming of a prince, Mel. Are you interested in her? That's strange, you haven't even met. I am not. It's just depressing to find out that someone you never even met doesn't like you. That's all. Slumbering Fables. Despite his near devastation by Nellie's news, Mel's flax and eyes continued to wander in hopes of catching sight of the girl. By now, it should be quite obvious to you what Mel was feeling. But the boy himself was having difficulty comprehending the things going through his heart. Emotionally, he was horribly unstable, like a ship without a sail. And still, every time he spied the white-haired girl, his heart would leap, his whole body jitter with anxiety and excitement. He had never felt anything like this before, and as such, he struggled to keep these strange emotions in check. Whenever he saw an opportunity, Mel would speak to the white-haired girl. In days he was unable to, he either spent in secluded silence, or distracted days. Love is a curious thing. It has the power to change those who experience it. When he did manage to approach her, he tripped over his tongue. Again and again he talked to her, and again and again he stumbled. I imagine if you were to take him to, to see a romance at the theater in his present state, he would cry just as much as little Nelly. We cry at tragedies because we draw parallels with our own lives. At least that's what I think. Great tales of romance attain true gravity with the audience only when they are personally familiar with love. In any event, the white-haired girl was, as a result of this, visibly perturbed. She was delighted that he was being so kind to her, but confusion overpowered every other emotion. She appeared to be at a loss as for what to do as he clumsily catapulted words and stared at her. But Mel did not back down, though he probably knew what it was. Though he probably knew not what caused such fiery emotion to erupt within his breast. I'm gonna need to stop to get a drink soon. One's first love, in particular, tends to burn like a wildfire. Are you familiar with the Sensation Master? Oh? Ah. There she is. Is she cleaning? No, it looks like she's reading. It's now or never. Boo. Ah. Sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. Lord Mel, you very clearly meant to scare me. Because you just wouldn't notice me. What are you reading? You look pretty engrossed. Oh, I I'm sorry. I should have asked for permission. It's fine. No need to apologize. Feel free to read whatever you want. And you're welcome to bring, back bring books back to your room if you'd like to spend more time with them. But 
I was just... I was just amazed. The mansion had a library. It must have been a lot of work to collect all these books. But there are some pretty old books in here, too. Your grandfather's? Some that he collected, and some even older than that. Take a look at this. I think it's a diary, but it's not from this country. Or this century, for that matter. Maybe a feudal lord. Here, he's complaining about the quality of the harvest. Can this forsaken land only produce over sour grapes? If only the largest of the, uh, Barney? Or maybe Barnier? If only the largest of the Barnier estates were mine instead. The land there is much more suitable to cultivation. There you have it. You can read this, Lord Mel? More or less. I looked over it several times already, so that wasn't too difficult. Why would such an old book be here? I'm not sure. It and all of this were already here when I moved into the mansion. Have you not lived here your whole life? I was born in our estate. But to me and Nelly, this is more like our home. We moved when I was still young, and we've lived here ever since. Nelly and Mother have both grown quite fond of it. Father, though, often goes back to the house because he doesn't like all the roses. By himself? Yeah, well, sometimes Mother goes with him. For the most part, he goes alone. But don't get me wrong, it's not because they don't get along. In fact, they act more like teenagers in love than grown adults. It almost makes me sick having to watch it. It is wonderful to be so close, no matter how old they may be. True, but still. There are those in the world who cannot be with the ones they care for as much as they may wish. I'm sorry about that. Uh, oh, that's right, the book. What were you reading? I um, wasn't exactly reading. I can't... I did not enjoy reading lots of text, so I was looking at the pictures. Is that so? You seem very cultured, so I thought you would be partial to reading. Perhaps you're actually more like Nelly and eschew your studies. I... yes. I wouldn't have guessed. But you like looking at pictures. I do. What else do you like? What? What do you enjoy doing? Stories. Stories. Yes, when I was young, my father would tell me tales. What kind of stories did you like? There was one about an imprisoned girl. Tell it to me. Once there was a girl, and she was locked away in a mansion deep in the forest. A mansion with only one window. But the window was high on the wall, where she could not reach. So it was always very dark inside, unlike this mansion. However, the girl did not like the outside world. There were lots of scary things out there, after all. Though she may have been all alone in the mansion, she grew comfortable with the darkness and time, so she had nothing to be afraid of. And then... Am I doing a good job? You're doing fine. Keep going. What happens next? Okay. And then, the girl grew up. By then, she had already forgotten why she was locked up, but she was content with the darkness. However, her eyes couldn't help but be drawn to the little bit of light that spilled through the one window. Though she was comfortable in the darkness, the sight of the light made her heart race. At first, the girl thought it was because she found it unpleasant, because she disliked the light and the outside. But slowly, she came to realize that she was curious about the outside world. What could be happening out there? For all she knew, the town, the forest, the people, all of it could have changed while she was imprisoned in the mansion. But she had no way of finding out. So the girl decided to write letters and threw them out the window. What began as empty grasping became routine and continued for several months until she was finally ready to give up. But then, a beautiful white dove flew in through the window. Tied to the dove's leg was a letter. Her heart racing, she read the words contained within. It seemed to have been written by a man. The letter contained numerous questions for the girl. 
also said that if she attached her reply to the dove, it would bring the letter back to him. She was astonished, but she wrote him back anyway, taking care not to mention where she was. After having exchanged letters a number of times, the two felt very close to one another, as though they had known each other for many years, despite having never met. And eventually the man said he wanted to meet her. Indeed. The girl was unsure what to do. Should she tell him of how she lived? Should she reveal where she spent her days? She was afraid if she did, he would cease to send her letters. She was sure he believed her to be a young lady of noble blood, and not a girl locked away in a house deep in the forest. The girl could not bring herself to write a response. She released the dove through the window with nothing attached to its leg. And yet, it returned with another letter written in the man's familiar hand. You must surely have a grave reason for your silence, it said. I would like to know that reason, and I would like to help you. No matter what it may be, you have my word. She deliberated. Though his letters were kind, she did not know this man. He was from the outside. Would he still treat her the same way when he met her? And did she even want to step out into the world beyond? What do you think she did? Wrote a letter and agreed to meet him, right? Yes, she did. The girl made up her mind. She would write a letter. As always, when she tied it to the dove's leg, it flew off out the window. And for some time after that, she received no response for the, from the man. This saddened her, but she thought it was for the best. She belonged in her own confined world, her world of darkness. But then one day, light shone into the mansion. The sealed door had been opened, and in the doorway stood a handsome young man. I have come for you, he said. The man was a prince from a neighboring kingdom. When the girl stepped outside, before her lay a magnificent caravan of carriages, the likes of which she had never before seen. The prince, kind as in the letters, swore his love to her, and the two lived happily ever after. What a nice story. I'm glad it had a happy ending. A prince. Was there something funny about the story? No, no, that's not why I was laughing. Do you ever imagine what it would be like if a prince showed up for you? Huh? It doesn't have to be a real prince. Even just someone like one. Is that something you dream about? Uh, no, um... I think I'm perhaps a little too old for that. You think so? Nellie still fantasizes about her prince, and she's 14. I just assumed all girls were the same. Lady Nellie's prince? That's you, Lord Mel, no? What? Uh, is it not? I mean, we used to play make-believe a lot when we were kids, but I very much doubt she still thinks of me that way in earnest. When she calls me her prince now, it's mostly in jest. If it weren't, that would be concerning. story. Do you know if it's a regional tale, or one that's been passed down through the ages? I'm not sure. Could very well be one of my, own fa my father's own creation. You might think me conceited, but I think the story might be about me. The girl trapped in the mansion is you. You haven't been locked up anywhere before, have you? No, thankfully. I have never been locked up before. Thank goodness. Like mine, I can sympathize with her being afraid of the outside world. I have, at times, imagined how wonderful life would be if it were only me and my father. But the girl left the house in the end. If your father really wrote that story, then I believe it contains his hope for you to end up the same way. Oh. I don't have what it takes to be a real prince and whisk you away, but. I can at least pretend. So, if it was your father's wish for you to see the outside world, then surely there's nothing wrong with you getting out and experiencing all the scenery that the world has to offer. I want to see the outside too. Or to be more specific, other countries. So, so, uh, if you'd like, we could maybe go see distant lands together. Ah, dearest Mel, I've been looking all over for you. Nelly, Look at this, dearest Mel. Mother bought me these wonderful gloves to wear on walks. 
The roses embroidered on the wrists are just precious. Oh my, you're right. They are beautiful. You appear to be dizzy, Lord Mel. Are you feeling unwell? No, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking a drink now. Or, no, I'm not. <laughs> Mel is feeling frustrated at his inability to convey his feelings to her. And as his frustration built up over time, he developed, I suppose you can call it, a severe case of lovesickness. For several consecutive nights, he had been afflicted with a, per with a peculiar sensation. A presence in his bedchamber. Death. Death to the unholy one. Death to the heretic. Death to the witch. Kill. Okay, I went almost an hour without a drink, so I think I kind of deserve that. Uh, why? I never wanted her to die. Was she not eating? Seal off the tower. Understood? No one finds out about this. How can you be so calm? Don't you understand what you've done? Pinning the blame on me? How nice it must be to be able to distort reality with panic. You're just as guilty as any of us. I never wanted her to die. Eh, she probably had it coming. The witch killed her. The blood of the witch killed my... So, I don't know if that's supposed to be like a dream of Mel's, or just something happening elsewhere that's coming his way. Let's go a little bit further and see. A dream? What was that dream? It was horribly unsettling. I was holding someone. A girl I cared for dearly in my arms, and she was limp. It was almost as if she were dead. I've been having a lot of really unpleasant dreams lately. I can't stop shaking. Why would I have such a dream? I feel sick. Back to sleep. But I wonder, who was that girl? I can sense someone standing beyond my door. Is someone there? It's like they're watching me. Is it just my imagination? I can't move. What do you want? Go away. The sound is growing fainter. I... Is that truly what your story meant, Father? But I... Such a magnificent garden. Something we could never have had. Are my intentions misguided? No, you could have sneaked into his room rather easily then. No one was watching. How long have you... Oh, you needn't pay me any mind. I shall not condemn you, no matter what you might do. Rather, I am on your side. I was not going to do anything. Oh, is that so? Then perhaps you were out for a late night stroll. I imagine you have less difficulties going outside at night. I beg your pardon. I will return to the mansion immediately. Yes, that reminds me. It was also in the middle of the night when the grocer's servant broke into their safe. News of that spread quite far. I am sure you would have heard about it. Oh? Although, was Gamash imprisoned? Dear me, I have trouble remembering. But worry not. If you wish for it, the mansion shall provide. You are in no danger whatsoever of getting caught. I... You said that a witch lives in the mansion, did you not? I did? 
Does that sound perhaps a bit archaic to you? No. I believe those rumors mockingly refer to me. Oh my. I've been accused of being a witch before. Which is amusing. I don't have any magical powers. I simply have an unusual appearance. My, what a lovely shade of red. The rose. Is something the matter? This rose. This rose was white. Until I took it in my hand. Is that so? I apologize. I must sound mad. I'm sure I was just mistaken. It couldn't possibly have changed. I wonder. Yes? Did the girl locked in the mansion become a princess? What? We should lock up and head to bed. Make sure all the shutters are closed nice and tight, and then draw the bar on the front door.